Guess what, bitches? I'm back! Over a decade ago, Avatar fans watched as one of our favorite characters hit her absolute lowest point. Sure, this was a cathartic moment for Zuko's redemption arc, but it still left us yearning for more from the Fire Nation princess. Azula ended the show at rock bottom, sobbing, alone and in chains. And while her fall from grace was necessary, that is not where her story ended. Because fast forward 15 years, and I can now confirm that Azula does eventually find the light again. Or more accurately, she finds it for the first time. In today's video, I'll explain how the upcoming Azula graphic novel will pave the path toward her redemption, and then I'll reveal how the most obscure of canon Avatar sources confirms that Azula does reconnect and reconcile with all of her old friends and with Team Avatar. Throughout the original show, Azula was an absolute menace. She not only struck down her enemies, but she also struck fear in their hearts, both on and off the battlefield. Where Zuko faltered, Azula effortlessly dominated with power, poise, and precision, making even her most seasoned adversaries look childish in comparison. But but then, everything changed when the Avatar attacked. At just 14 years old, the young princess, once the Fire Nation's pride and joy, found herself alienated from society and at the mercy of her older brother. Azula had spent her entire life fighting desperately to avoid this exact situation. Every move she'd ever made, every victory over Zuko, was to ensure she maintained the privileged position of the Fire Lord's favorite child. You must understand that within the Fire Nation's elite circles, respect was earned through ruthlessness, cunning, and decisive action. And in a world where only the respected could survive, Azula thrived. But then in one fell swoop, her divine sense of entitlement crumbled as without her status and her enabler, Azula's place in society was in question for the very first time ever. And she broke. Following the war, with no allies or trusted family by her side, Azula saw two paths forward. The first option would demand acknowledgement of her past wrongdoings and a genuine pursuit of redemption. This journey would mean leaning on others, embracing vulnerability, attempting to make selfless amends and addressing the deep-seated traumas of her upbringing. Moreover, she'd likely need a guiding light, a mentor or familiar figure who could help steer her in the right direction. On the other hand, the second option was much more straightforward. Azula could simply remain loyal to the principles ingrained by her father. This route wouldn't require any outside assistance, is what Azula knows best, and even stripped of everything else, the princess was still highly self-sufficient. In the comics that pick up after the show's finale, Azula's choices repeatedly reflected her decision as she consistently fell back on old habits time and time again. She had remained convinced that trust is for fools. fools. Fear is the only reliable way. And that is the mindset that persisted all the way through the concluding chapters of the Smoke and Shadow comic trilogy, which as of today was Azula's final canonical appearance. Or was it? Contrary to popular belief, Azula's story did not sputter out after that 2016 comic. While it is true that Azula isn't even mentioned in any of the graphic novels since then, the princess's flame refused to fully die out. Two years ago in 2021, her story picked back up in the unlikeliest of places, the official and canon Avatar The Last Airbender cookbook. Stay with me here. The Avatar cookbook doesn't just stand out due to its plethora of mouth-watering recipes inspired by the Four Nations cuisines and cultures. No, this book is also an in-universe canonical document that's filled with lore and is accessible to us fans in the real world. The premise is that years after the war, Aang, with a vision of unity, decides to compile recipes from around the globe. He recognized that after a century of isolation, the citizens of the Four Nations could use his cookbook as a way to reconnect and relish in each other's cultures via the diverse delectable dishes. What follows is over 60 recipes curated by the Avatar's friends and allies. Each one is prefaced with a handwritten note detailing the dish's origin, its cultural and personal significance, shifts in its ingredients due to globalization, and, most importantly, glimpses into the character's post-war lives. Everyone in the gang pitched in, including Suki, <clears throat> even though Aang overlooked her again in his list of friends. But the cookbook also features tons of unexpected entries from various side characters, like the Duke, who dedicates his pork belly recipe to Jet. There's contributions from Yu, the Swamp Bender, there's this beverage concoction from the Boulder, and even a handful of recipes from the Cabbage Merchant that all highlight his signature ingredient. Cabbage! Now, while all the meals in the cookbook look super inventive and tasty, it also seems like they would take quite a while to make. Going to the grocery store and all that prep time and cleaning is just a bit too much, especially during the fall season when I'm a bit busier than normal. That's why I'm so glad to have recently discovered Factor, the sponsor of today's video. Factor is a fresh, never frozen meal delivery service that sends gourmet chef selected meals right to your front door. Factor meals are ready in just two minutes, which saves you a ton of time, especially when they offer so many nutritious and tasty options. My favorite 
favorite so far has been the roasted tomato and feta cavatappi pasta with a side of broccoli and red peppers. I complimented my meal with the carrot, orange, and ginger curd press juice, and it honestly felt like something straight out of the Air Nomad section of the Avatar cookbook. If you want to try Factor and simplify your eating routine, then head to factor75.com or click the link below and use code BABYLION50 to get 50% off your first Factor box. There are over 30 chef prepared meals waiting for you every single week, so save your time and your money by checking out Factor, link below. Bringing it back to Avatar, this cookbook is so thorough it even spells out how to make Sokka's cactus juice, although missed opportunity by not making that one a cocktail. The point is, this thing is filled to the brim with lore! And wouldn't you know it, one of the recipes was written by Princess Azula herself. Ooh, let me read this part. It's about yours truly after all. <clears throat> Azula's lightning. I was appalled when I first heard this drink was going to bear my name. How can something so static like a beverage even attempt to convey the sense of power I possess? May eventually convince me to try it. Only she ever dares bother me with the suggestions I've already refused. And it's not terrible. If the people of the Fire Nation see me in this way, like a jolt of lightning, cold and hot at the same time, I suppose that's not such a bad thing. Um, thank you, Azula. And by the way, for those watching, if you want to hear more professional voice imitators like her bring the Avatar comics to life, then check out their YouTube channel, The Book 4 Air Restoration Project. They've already released a few episodes of the comics, fully dubbed and animated with custom soundtracks and art pieces. If you've been curious about the post-war stories at all, then I think this is the best way to experience them. Anyway, Azula's recipe. The fact that she wrote this at all means that she's on relatively fantastic terms with Aang. Remember, the last time we saw Azula in the comics, she was kidnapping kids, bitch slapping Tai Li, and relishing the thought of turning Zuko into a tyrant. In short, she was nowhere close to a position where we'd expect Aang to be hitting her up for food wrecks. Furthermore, it's noteworthy that Mei and Azula still maintain a close line of communication. Even more so that Mei is now apparently one of the very few people whom Azula holds in high enough regard to heed her advice. Again, let's not diminish their previous encounter. It was fraught with tension and filled with shouts, knives, lightning, and threats to disfigure Mei's new boyfriend. So clearly, a lot has transpired, and we still lack almost any context for what ultimately provokes Azula's transformation. Additionally, despite my best efforts combing through these recipes, I was unable to pinpoint the in-universe date that Aang might have made this cookbook. In my opinion though, the timeline's ambiguity is quite revealing in and of itself. It suggests that Avatar Studios is being very thoughtful and deliberate with the canon materials they publish. By excluding a discernible timeline in these smaller releases, the franchise avoids pigeonholing itself or limiting the scope or possibilities of their future projects. Case in point, this cookbook goes out of its way to include an entire section for the Jasmine Dragons menu. Iro provides instructions for crafting Bender's Tea, the Abba Blend Bubble Tea, and intriguingly a brew called Red-Blooded Nephew named after Zuko. What's astonishing is that those exact same drinks were first mentioned years ago in an entirely different in-universe avatar book. In Legacy of the Fire Nation, an end-of-life memoir penned by Uncle Iro for Zuko, the tea shop's physical menu was handed down, and on it, every single drink from the new cookbook was accounted for. Like it or not, it's clear that Avatar Studios isn't running blind and these in-universe books are deliberate and undeniably canon pieces of a much larger puzzle. Regarding the cookbook's timeline, all we get is that quote, years have passed since the war's end. Katara mentions the rapid growth of the Misty Palm Oasis, predicting that by the next generation, the city will bustle once again, which was corroborated in The Legend of Korra. Similarly, Katara indicates that the once contaminated River City, Jinghua, has undergone a remarkable transformation as, by the cookbook's time, it is renowned for its luxurious seafood exports. But while those are great world building nuggets, they don't help suggest a timeline. Like how long does it take to unpollute a biologically desolate river? 5 years? 15? Google says around 20 to 30. Hmm. The cookbook does conspicuously avoid mentioning some things though like they're the plague, namely Republic City, which in the comics was still called Cranefish Town. At the end of Imbalance, the last of the comic trilogies, Team Avatar all decided to settle down in the growing peninsula, presumably for several decades as we know they all go on to start families and careers in the area. Referencing either name, Cranefish Town or Republic City would have narrowed things down significantly. The deliberate omission of the culturally blended melting pot city in a book dedicated to unifying the diverse cultures is simply incongruous. It doesn't add up. Other notable snubs include any elder characters like Grand Grand, King Bumi, or Guru Patik. While several recipes are attributed to them, there's no hint about their current, um, 
a life status. There's also no baby talk. If the cookbook was penned, say, five years after Imbalance or eight years after the series finale, then Katara and Aang's first child, Boomy, should have entered the picture by now. Essentially, Avatar Studios isn't about to be caught slipping. They're not giving away their future plans so easily, though one thing remains certain, a redemption arc for Princess Azula is on the horizon. My guess is that whatever's in store for the character, it will likely unfold on the big screen. We know that Avatar Studios is currently working on at least three animated movies, the first of which is scheduled for theaters on October 10th, 2025. The film is set to center on Team Avatar, with casting notes depicting Aang as a 24-year-old young adult. That places the story roughly nine years after the Imbalance comic, which is in line with when the cookbook could have been made. Imagine that Team Avatar ties up all the Azula loose ends in the movie, and then Aang celebrates soon after by compiling the world's recipes. Now the final piece of this puzzle is the Azula comic book that's coming out at the end of October in just a few weeks. The synopsis of Azula in the Spirit Temple says that the princess has sustained her efforts to destabilize the Fire Nation and her brother, Fire Lord Zuko. But then, following a failed mission, Azula finds herself in a mystic forest temple inhabited by a lone monk. And it is there that, quote, Azula must confront her past and finally face her chance at redemption. So there you have it, and it seems pretty cut and dry. Granted, book summaries do often double as promotional hype material, but still, it's evident that Avatar Studios remains invested in furthering Azula's story and delving deeper into this character's complexities. A sneak peek of the comic's early pages was provided ahead of its release, and the story appears to resume shortly after Azula's most recent comic sighting roughly two years after the war. Azula is still working with her cohort of Fire Nation rebels, clashing against Tai Li and what seems to be a handful of Fire Nation guards. Tai Li dodges lightning, which is pretty cool, and she really just seems to be way more empowered than ever before. Azula is actually the one forced to retreat, and the segment ends with Tai Li vowing to hunt her down. Talk about a row reversal. The other scene teased in the preview is of a much different tone. It shows what I assume is a dream sequence that reveals how Azula wishes others perceived her. On a sunlit beach, Ozai and Ursa radiate happiness, united and proudly declaring Azula as their favorite child. Iroh and a scar-free Zuko sing her praises too as she's bossing Sei's conqueror and the Avatar's slayer. Her ancestors, Sozin and Azulan, are present. And even a jock from the beach episode who was previously sipping for Tai Li now only has eyes for the princess. But just when Azula and her mother finally embrace, her idyllic dream is interrupted by caricatures of Mei and Tai Li who coldly bring Azula back to reality. Just like in the show and in the Avatar cookbook, Mei has always been the one best suited to cut through the many layers of Azula's psyche. The preview ends with Azula waking up, probably in the temple, and talking to this lady who's probably the spirit. Considering the comic is only 80 pages long, I'm incredibly skeptical about witnessing a full-blown redemption arc here. It just isn't enough time to make any meaningful transformation believable or to do justice to the depth of Azula's character. We've already seen Avatar's first attempt at redeeming a young, morally corrupt female antagonist, and spoiler alert, the results were pretty mid. Kulvira's salvation story felt both underdeveloped and way too narratively convenient to be very impactful. And that was with a full comic trilogy, three times longer than what Azula's working with. The other glaring issue is that culminating Azula's story in this random comic would just be a dumb move from a franchise strategy standpoint. Relegating such a pivotal storyline to a niche graphic novel that's realistically mainly going to be read by YouTubers just makes zero sense, especially when the alternative option involves weaving her redemption into a cinematic masterpiece worthy of theatrical release. If I had to guess, this upcoming comic will see Azula taking the first initial small baby steps toward a brighter path. Redemption shouldn't be a mere flick of the wrist, it should be a tumultuous journey that makes Azula struggle a lot. Remember Zuko screaming at a storm, praying to be struck by lightning, or him being bedridden for a full week after doing one singular nice thing? Yeah, we need to see Azula's version of that. Azula's journey should require intent, sincerity, and persistence, and the very first obstacle that she must overcome is self-realization. Azula cannot be quote-unquote redeemed if she does not fully comprehend or doesn't fully appreciate the gravity of her misdeeds. She must acknowledge and come to terms with her past mistakes and in Azula's case, a significant part of this introspection should likely revolve around unraveling the deep-rooted traumas of her upbringing and addressing the strained dynamics of her fractured relationships. Azula in the Spirit Temple will dive headfirst into this intricate process. Through her spirit-aided dreams and visions, Azula will finally confront the hard truths and epiphanies required to begin making amends. Or at least, by the conclusion, Azula will have gone from liking being an evil agent of chaos to feeling just a little bit better 
bad about her shenanigans. Call it chaotic neutral. Either way, now you know exactly where this whole thing is headed. So now, all that's left to do is to wait, as we let Azula cook.